All right. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. This is our Defunding Law Enforcement Agencies and Rebuilding Communities of Color, provided by Jolt. This is our discussion panel that we have for you today. I'm Clark Marshall. I'm a student activist. Um, I'm involved in Jolt and NAACP. I used to be at uh, University of Houston, and now I'll be going to Laterno University um, in Texas. So First, I would like to thank everyone here. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, all of our speakers are gonna be great tonight, you guys. You're in for a load of good information. Um, so Jolt Action is a nonprofit organization, um, is committed to, to uh, mobilizing Latinx community uh, students so that we can um, impact the world and, our, and be civically engaged. So today we'll be talking about um, the parallels of defunding police and defunding ICE. Um, and how the Latinx and Black communities can work together to reimagine what criminal justice looks like in the, this country. So first, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Today, we have Denise Benavides, an LA-born activist now residing in Dallas, Texas, where she started LULAC Council, along with currently organizing and campaigning for different projects and fighting for oppressed people. We also have Chaz Moore, founder of Austin Justice Coalition, aimed at criminal justice reform and advocating for underserved communities. 
And last but not least, we have Deborah, co-founder of Undocu Black Network, a national organizer, a national organizer for Black LGBTQ plus Migrant Project or BLMP. So thank you guys for joining and we're gonna just jump in. So first let's talk, I would like to just open it up to whoever wants to go first. We can start with Denise if you would like to go. Um, what does defunding the police mean to you? Um, to me, defunding the police is such a big conversation, right? Because it goes into different communities. Um, and so to me personally, because I'm in the immigration um, activism world, um, it looks like also protecting the undocumented community. Um, a lot of people um, don't know that police and ICE work together. And so we know that a lot of the funds that the police department already gets goes towards um, undocumented communities that are black and brown and Asian and that um, it, we're effect they're affected by that. Um, a lot of people don't know that um, we currently have ICE in Dallas County jails. So if an undocumented person gets pulled over for maybe traffic warrants, um, then they'll be get they'll have an ice hold. Um, we've heard stories of people being arrested for fishing without a license and then getting deported for that. And so to me, that's what defunding the police would look like. It would look like getting more health care, like mental health care for communities also. It looks like community engagement. It, um, it's such a big conversation, you know, because it goes into different communities. Right. Deborah, would you like to speak on it? Absolutely. Um, first, I think in the framing, we should understand that when we talk about how can Latinx and Black communities work together, um, it's not so like, black and white um, or black and brown in this case, right? It's um, when you say Latinx, we're talking about all sorts of races of people, including black folks. Um, and then when you talk about defunding police, we're talking about, um, we're talking about impacting black immigrants as well. Um, there are probably around a million undocumented black immigrants um, who are impacted by both ICE and police. So like Comrade Denise mentioned, the two are so interlinked that um, we need to get rid of both. But defunding the police in particular from an abolitionist perspective, which is the one that I personally hold, um, would is, is sort of like removing a mole when you have a cancer that has spread to your internal organs. So we defund the police, we've gotten rid of one mole um, and yet, the at-large problem is still spreading towards throughout our internal organs. And that at-large problem is capitalism. Um, the reason why police and law enforcement in general has ballooned is because capitalism invests in the subjugation of communities of color and profits off of our subjugation. So like Denise mentioned, every night a person is in a detention center, black or brown or otherwise, um, people are getting paid. Private prisons and government jails are um, lining their pockets at our expense. And this isn't anything new. Um, for over 400 years, um, capitalism through the transatlantic slave trade has grown and become this parasite on the backs of black and brown folks. So we absolutely, um, defunding the police means incapacitating their budget and making it harder for them to continue profiting off of our um, pain and suffering and death. Um, I'm a black woman. I was formerly undocumented. I grew up here in Austin, South and East Austin. Um, and I have seen how working class communities have heightened chance of coming into contact with law enforcement. And pardon me for being a bit long winded, but to share a couple of examples, um, you know, in middle school uh, down the street, I remember a school resource officer pinning down a black classmate of mine who was selling candy in order to make ends meet for his struggling family. 
Um, and then in high school, I remember my dad was working at a corner store and um, he was presented by a fake ID uh, by an undercover actor who was buying a beer at, at the will of Austin Police Department. They did that to try to capture people, to try to capture working class people like my father. And they did, they arrested him. And um, then in college at UT Austin, also down the street, I remember uh, UTPD pulled over a comrade for a broken taillight, a broken taillight. Then UT Police Department reported him to Austin Police Department and Austin Police Department reported him to Immigration Customs and Enforcement. And he was placed in deportation proceedings that, for a broken taillight that he couldn't afford to fix. So these are how some examples of how these things work together and why we need to absolutely defund the police at bare minimum. All right, I'm done, I promise. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Chaz? No, I mean, I think um, I don't have really anything to add to to what they said. And I'm, you know, now I'm wondering why I'm here. I think they can do this by themselves. But, <laughs> um, you, you know, I think um, I think Deborah brings up a good point. Um, and, you know, something I said when we did the the rally on June 7th um, is that like this is bigger than policing. Right. Like it, it's a lot of people um, that if we, you know, got rid of all the police departments tomorrow, they think we won. Right. And it, that, that's not the case. Right. If we still have people. Um, that are um, in prison, so we still have people that are hungry and poor and on the streets, then, you know, the, the, the movement has to keep going, right? Um, you know, I think Deborah brought up a good point, like policing in this moment that we're in, uh, which is great and beautiful, and I, I never thought I would see it, it's about, um, you know, like Angela Davis says when she talks about being radical, getting to the root cause of something, right? Um, we know that police is so intertwined in this thing of capitalism, right? Like, you know, like the board said, instead of um, taking somebody to jail for a broken taillight, let's fix the taillight. But the system doesn't want you to fix the taillight because they want to be able to keep keep you in this, this loophole of poverty and, and, and all this type of crazy stuff. Um, so, you know, defunding the police to me means um, a small step, a very small step in undoing racism and undoing these systems and undoing white supremacy and, and all these things and getting back to um, people, right? Like how do we invest in people? How do we invest in community solutions, right? Um, and that's something across the board. The more I do this work and the more I learn about stuff, um, you know, like if, if only we had more doulas, for example, maybe black women wouldn't die so much just from giving birth. Um, if we had more, um, you know, community-based and community-ran, um, you know, gang intervention, that's what the system likes to call it. Um, you know, now we have people that know how to talk to people when they are going through, um, 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 you know, inflictions with one another. And they, we can, like black and brown people know how to deescalate because that's something that's just a part of our culture. Um, so, you know, I think defunding the police means saying and finally realizing and coming to, to reckon with the fact that this does not work. Let's go back to us. Let's go back to the community because we have the answers for these things the system say they're trying to fix and they only cause it more harm. Thank you. Thank you for all of y'all's um, comments and everything. This is getting good, so I'm liking it. So I want to dive, dive deep. Um, both of you, all of you guys touched on things that I want to kind of go into and it's going to lead to our next question of that. I think a lot of people will have concern that when you say defund the police, is it, does, I mean, like if you take money out of the police stations or if you take money out of anything, when you think about it, will it hinder their training or will it like, will it hinder the police force as a whole? Because the problem is, is that you know, with them having, you know, doing chokeholds that they have no kind of uh, training on, you know, or resulting straight to a gun. If you defund them, would that affect the way that, um, would that affect that they would do more of that kind of thing? Would they result faster to a gun? You know, if you defund them, are we taking away training funding? You know, where is that funding coming from would be my first question. Um, second question would be, that I mean, some people will think that okay, we take away the police, and you know, we all know police. All police are not bad, right? And so, if you take away funding, would it just increase crime rates? You know, so if you want to touch on either of those questions, I think they kind of go hand in hand. Whichever one you want to go, start with. Um, we'll work backwards this time. So let's start with Chaz. Um. So, you, I, I think it's um. So one, you, you know, I think the people that have the most problem around the defunding. 
um, conversation is people with the most privilege, uh, right? Which is typically white people, rich people, um, and men, like men in general, right? No matter if you're black, white, you know, whatever. Um, and, and I think we have to, that's important to say because all of this is about um, disrupting like all the status quo, right? Um, so I think people, um, as, as much as we fight the system and try to uproot it and create something new, we also have to remind people that hold that privilege that this thing is really not working for you either, right? That, that's a huge misconception that, that people buy into. Um, you know, a key example of that is, um, and I'm going off tangent, but I'm saying things that I think are important. Um, you know, I, I, I hate when I see um, people of color, you know, in the streets fighting white supremacy, but then I still hear them use like, um, you know, like gender slurs or, you know, they're using slurs that are, you know, like um, anti um, anti LGBTQ. So it's just like, you know, because because like one aspect of our identities wants to protect ourselves. Um, and in order to do that, you kind of have to shake up these systems. But then we forget about these other things like the board said earlier, that are part of this one thing, right? So you can't just say defund the police and you're not doing the work you need to do to make sure um, people at the at the bottom of the spectrum, which is like, you know, black, indigenous, um, you know, the, the immigrant community, trans folks, like we also have to check all of that that comes with that as well. Um, so again, I, I really think it's about the, yeah, I really think in my personal opinion, um, the people that are uncomfortable with that need to keep doing that work and do the internal work so they can be okay and, and understand that they cannot be fully liberated operating under the system. Like the system will not let you be op like liberated uh, with these things while they exist. And then also, you know, to answer your question, um, the, the, the whole purpose of defunding is to disrupt and dismantle the police system, right? So yes, like that's what it's supposed to do. Um, no, but like nobody cares about their training anymore, right? And that comes from somebody that does policy work. I think um, the, the policy work is still something that we kind of have to do, but we have to also make sure that we speak true to power in that lane, right? Like the policy, um, to me, the policy work that we do, um, and I'm, and, you know, I'm really trying to co-opt it into becoming radical reform to where it's just not like this, this little like BS thing. Um, reform, like true meaningful reform has to be like Hodor for anybody that's watching that watches Game of Thrones, right? As people <laughs> are moving forward to become liberated. I think um, reform to me, if it's used properly, is that that like that 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 um that tool that stops the system momentarily because if we don't do the work in between the system as designed will swallow us whole right imagine if nobody protested you know um at city hall or on a federal level at congress like i don't think we would have got the daca win right which was a small win i don't think we would have got these wins and really the fact that we have to fight for those is a whole nother conversation but um, you know, it's, it's really about making sure that we are really uprooting these things and creating something new so we can all benefit. I mean, I hope that made sense. Yes, thank you. Yes, I think that, I mean, you guys are going off on tandems. That's totally fine. I mean, you know, it's giving us information about what you guys are thinking and what, you know, the public needs to hear of how to think about things, you know, go about it. Um, Deborah, would you like to go or Denise? I guess we can go with Deborah, then we'll finish up with Denise for this question. Oh, Denise, you gotta go. Um, also, just to like also help you guys, I mean, or to piggyback off of what he just said, I mean, the new, um, the new stimulus bill actually added an FBI building, you know? And it's like thinking about like, where is this money going? And like, you know, how is it being used? Like this is, that's defunding, you know, like where is this money being handled? So just to, and, uh, yeah, that, that's exactly what I was going to touch on. A lot of people think that defunding the police means, oh, my God, we're not going to have police anymore. And I think um, it's that's a really um, drastic way to see it. Um, it just means really looking at where their money is going. I mean, let's be real. They have a lot of um, like military stuff that they shouldn't have. A cop shouldn't have certain kind of guns or um just stuff that is on the street you know 
that it's supposed to use for the military, um, number one. Number two, it also means finding out their programs. There's a lot of programs in there that they're not really doing nothing with, but yet they keep funding these programs that aren't helping. So then let's, let's look into those programs and see, okay, where is this broken? Why aren't you guys doing anything with this? You know, because a lot of people tell me, well, they already have a mental health program. Well, really? Because the community doesn't see it. I live in Oak Cliff. I mean, down the street for me, we have a trap house. And there's people that park down the street where we have families that are shooting up drugs. I mean, and there's nobody coming in to help them. You know what I mean? And so all that's important. There's, I, there's a lot of people down on my street that have mental health issues. And I always see cops, DP, you know, DPD, pull them, like have them on the side and they're just harassing them instead of looking for actual help for them. And I think that that to me is what defunding looks like. Um, also, when I was um, in Tornillo, I saw a lot of companies profiting off of what was going on. Um, in Tornillo, it was being ran by a Baptist organization called BCFS, which is Baptist Christian Family Services. And so they're getting funding for incarcerating unaccompanied minor children, might I add, children that have sponsors, but they weren't letting them go because they were getting between $300 to $500 a child a bed per day. And so this is what, to me, defunding the police looks like, looking at where the money is going. And so moving these, this money and these services to programs that are going to work and working with community organizers, people that are on the ground that have, you know, that have these relationships with the community and that understand the community in a different way. I think that also has a lot to do with it. I think there's a huge gap between law enforcement and the community. And so we also need to bring back that engagement um, with the community and law enforcement in a way, because obviously we're not gonna get rid of law enforcement. I mean, that's the reality, um, but we could definitely move this money around to where it helps everybody, you know, and it looks like it's something where we're actually getting help. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, all of this is good. I'm getting good at feedback ideas. I hope I hope everyone that's look that's listening is you know taking all this information in, and this is a good platform. I love this. Deborah, would you like to go? Yeah, I think so. Perhaps. Um, in our lifetimes, we won't see an end to the police state as it stands, but um, I do believe that um, we need to abolish police and ICE. Um, there's no, there's no uh, amount of body cameras or trainings, diversity trainings, or like making sure there's more black cops out there that will um, reduce our pain. Um, again, like I mentioned earlier, this is all connected to um, profit. And for as long as our bodies are profitable, the system will continue to proliferate law enforcement in all the different programs like Denise mentioned. So for example, there's a program called the 1033 program, um, which allows military grade equipment. I mean, like fingerprints, um, technology and just things your average local police department really doesn't need. And what happens is the military, after they're, you know, done using it like a rental car, they go ahead and they give it away to local police departments. And so you're seeing um, tactics uh, and equipment that are used either by military or torture agencies in the streets of Austin, Texas. Like why does Runberg and Riverside here at home need any of those types of um, surveillance and equipment? Uh, it doesn't, but again, our pain is profitable. Our torture and subjugation is profitable. And so we actually have to be ready, um, one, to think about this in a way like, Maybe we won't abolish them tomorrow, but the 
the we have to orient in our, uh, ourselves in a way where we prepare to organize and defend our own neighborhoods because we know um, that none of the reforms of the past has kept them from murdering civilians. And also we know we want to have faith in the only system we've ever known, what since grade school, we've only been taught one kind of system. And so we want to take comfort that there's ways to improve whatever kinks it has. Um, but we can't appeal, unfortunately, to the local and federal government as a way to protect ourselves long term. Um, so I can get behind defunding them significantly, but we have to be acutely aware of how um, our laws have been set up to actually protect and proliferate um, the state and policing. Um, and we also have to be ready, unfortunately, when we're out here talking about defunding and abolishing, we have to be ready for vigilantes um, to, to find, like to, to act out and be like, oh, you think you don't need police? Let me show you how much you do need police. And that's why this past weekend here in Austin, a comrade um, who had been protesting for Black Lives was murdered by a racist vigilante. And people like him are proliferating under the Trump administration. So this is all connected. And we saw that the police response was slow and really effective right there on the scene. People, so many eyewitnesses accounts, eyewitness accounts of how unprotective they were. And so, yeah, I just don't think there's any relying on them, no matter how many examples you give me of, well, one time a good cop helped me change my tire and jump started my battery. Um, it doesn't matter because again, um, they are a part of a larger system. So they need to quit their jobs is my opinion. All the ICE officers, border patrol, migra and police quit their jobs because um, you're upholding a system of oppression and we don't need you. Well said, well said. <laughs> I mean, with that, woof, yeah, this is getting a little heated. I love it. This is what we need to have. And I hope that people are going to continue these talks. And that's my hope is that going forward, you know, none of this is set in stone or, you know, just anyone's, you know, flat out what's going to happen. It's just about getting this conversation started, you know, and stimulated and having these, you know, awkward, conver tough conversations with people that need to hear them, right? So I hope this keeps on expanding. Um, a good point that you just mentioned, uh, next we're gonna go into some uh, questions that we're getting from some, uh, we're getting from some viewers that I'm looking at, is uh, that this is a systematic problem, right? We all know that. It's a systematic problem. And the root of what I'm hearing from what you guys are saying is defunding the police would mean interrupting the system, like Chad said, and like, you know, getting to the root of it is that it's all messed up, right? And you just have to rearrange it. We're going to have to do something else, but we know that this isn't working right now. Um, so going with that, we're going to dive into also some private prison um, question we just have. It says, what can be done to ensure private prison corporations like GEO Group, CCA, and MTC, among others, no longer make profit off of Black and Brown communities? I think this is a great question because like we said, if we defund the police, that's more um, when people think about it, I think they think more government, you know, wise, but you have the private prisons where they can't be regulated by the government, they can do what they want to. So it's like, how can we stop them to no longer make a profit off of us and keep us in that system where we keep going back to their prisons and they still make money off of us, $500 a bed, you know? So if anyone would like to start with that. Um, Denise, would you I'll like start. to go first? Yeah, I'll start. Okay. GEO, um, I know them, per, not know them personally, but I know of them really well because they're one of the main ones that have detention centers, um, especially here in Texas. There's many of them here. Um, but the important part, it's, it's so complicated, you know, because it's privatized. So it's like you said, they run it like a business. They don't see it anymore as, you know, protect and serve. They see it now how we're going to make money off of, arresting and um, detaining and holding people. And so um, 
how do you that's and that's such a good question you know like how do we and i think deborah could probably help me better with this question because how do we how do we get rid of these private prisons i mean for me in my in my case i would probably go like towards getting like legislation but it's just there's there's it's so complicated because there's so many people like with you look at the people that are in charge of these places you realize that oh their son is their father is some republican congressman lobbyist who you know what i mean so it's such a web that it's like it's such an entanglement <laughs> i guess you can say <laughs> so so, so Deborah, i want to say something really quick because i know you have uh, a more prolific answer than i do for this question um but you know I, I, I always felt that if the American people just stopped going to work, um, like if we just stop working, if we stop, if we get off the hamster wheel, right, like um, that, that keeps this thing going, if we just did it for like a week or two, um, and, and, and honestly, right, like if, you know, if people that work for these corporations or work for these entities that feed into these corporations that cause us harm, whether it's directly or indirectly, um, then the system stops. Um, but that also means that, you know, us poor people, um, that's what they call us, us working class people, we have to get the billionaire mindset, right? Now we have to, because billionaires, they make a billion bucks and then they hoard it. They keep all the resources for themselves. So I think if we just really stop going to work, um, because the, the, the problem with labor in this country, um, in many parts of the world, is that um, nobody has a problem with the concept of labor. It's, it's the fact that you don't appreciate me, you don't see me, you don't value me, right? Um, and I think if we just stop going to work, the power that um, we see and, and how much power that we actually see that we have, it, it would be just unimaginable. Because like, you know, I, I agree with Deborah with the capitalist thing, but the problem is every day, as much as we hate the system, we go to work, right? Like we, we go back to the job we hate, we go back to, the cubicle and the office and work with the people we hate. And then we'll go to the rally and then we'll go to the protest and say, you know, the system is crooked as hell. But then we then on Tuesday, we go back to work. Right. And I think for me, the, the most impactful thing we could do. And I think when we get to that point of mass movement and the mass consciousness, realize that if we stop going to work, then we can really change the whole game. And that also means that for the people that stop going to work, um, the people that have been out of work, they can't they they can't cross the picket line either, right? Um, there's so much about getting the things we need as a community, as a global community, comes from the willingness um, when we're ready to to struggle together, right? And I really think when we when we just stop giving into this system that's that exploits us, that doesn't care about us, um, it 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 dies, you know. Um, so I know the board is going to say this in some beautiful ass way, so. Thanks. You're giving me more credit than I deserve, but I, this is a hard question, y'all. Like we are being asked, how do we get rid of some of the most uh, profitable um, businesses in the country? And something important for us to remember is that the majority of immigrants who are detained by immigration are not detained by a private prison. Um, they're just government funded, our taxpayers, our, our tax dollars um, are what sustain all of the government contracts um, to detain more and more immigrants. So if we could, I, I agree with Chaz uh, that um, uh, our labor is what creates wealth. The labor of the working class is definitively what creates wealth wealth. There's no CEO, no millionaire, billionaire, trillionaire, Elon Musk, that does the amount of work that migrant laborers, farm workers, and all of us in the service industry or what have you do. There's no comparing it. Um, if we were to stop this country's economy tomorrow, every demand we have would be met again, not because of their kindness, but because we managed to organize on our own behalf, in our own interests. 
the evil of capitalism or one of the evils of capitalism is that they keep us busy. We only got 24 hours in one day. Eight hours, normally more, but at least eight hours is for working. Eight hours, normally less, is for sleeping. And then we only have eight hours to organize our communities. And mostly we just want to take a break. We just want to not think. We just want to watch Red Table Talk on Facebook, you know? And so I think when it comes to private prisons, uh, geo group, CCA, um, I wanna see the end of those and the majority of immigrants are not detained by those entities. Um, I do think our labor creates all wealth. And today I got a call from someone who I've been talking to for over a year, who's detained in immigration detention. Um, he was criminalized as a black man. And then after serving his time in regular degular prison was then sent to immigration detention and has been in detention for the last three years. And now he has come down with coronavirus and he's extremely ill and we're trying to get him out. You, th These things are all again, connected. They're profiting every day that he stays detained, even if it means his life could be lost. And so um, he is detained in actually a, C uh, a geo group um, uh, detention center. So I would love to see all of their contracts canceled. And I do think that has to do with how we are allowing our tax dollars to be used and how we can hold those companies accountable by withholding our labor. And everybody should look into uh, COSECHA, an organization that has been working on general strikes for laborers for a really long time now. Look, if y'all start a program or if y'all start a movement to not go to work, I'm coming. <laughs> no, but uh, thank you for y'all's uh, input on that. Um, I do think that that would be definitely just, I mean, that's disrupting the system at, you know, the highest possible point. I mean, because if there's one thing everybody does, it's, it's everyone speaks money, right? <laughs> so I think disrupting the system on that level would definitely be, wow, I think that would literally transform the world. I mean, within hours, <laughs> definitely a form of it. We have some more questions. Um, are there currently professional career positions that can take over some of the duties a police officer has in communities? If so, what are these positions and how would they be a better alternative than a police officer? Um, before we get into that, I was absolutely just thinking of an example for just about this and linking what we just talked about um, in private prisons, right? So I think people with money and wealth see, okay, what is a need that the poor people have? Okay, well, we need more places to put people right, in jails. So they make their own private prisons. Then they figure out a way to make us work for them to, to, um, to in, you know, to imprison our own people. Because when you go to most prisons, I don't know about you guys, but I live about 20 minutes from Huntsville, huge prison, and everyone I know there, terribly under, like, underserved people that are in, you know, low-income communities. And who are in, in their jail cells? People they know. I mean, literally working for them, you know, in the system. And it's just like, it's going back and forth. It's about not only, you know, going to work and how we're gonna work for them, but also how we spend our money. We get our money from them. Well, let's take it somewhere else. You know what I mean? Or wherever we're gonna do for it. But, you know, that's one example that I was just thinking about. So we wanna think about how can, what career positions can be filled by other people besides police officers or what kind of duties can be uh, passed over if the police are defunded, if we did that extreme. Does anyone have something they want to say really bad? Want to go first? <laughs> so, so I, I think the answer to that question is is humans, right? Like, I, I, I think I think we can do that work. I think um, you know, again, when you when you do when you just read about indigenous folks, uh, primarily indigenous women, um, they, they were doing these things, right? Like, they they had the systems in place to make sure uh, when people messed up, uh, indigenous communities in general, when people did something that was out of the social con um, um, contract that they had, they held them accountable. It wasn't punitive, but they held them accountable when people needed healing and help before we got to like westernized medicine and all this stuff. Like all these things ex existed before, right? Um, and I think it's important that we that we keep that in mind because I think um, we fall victim to trying to answer these questions in the box, right? Um, and that box is very much a part of like the system institution that we've been placed in. 
Um, so I, 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 to me, the real answer to that question is humans. I think your neighbor and the people in your community, if we can get back to a sense of, of reclaiming and redefining what community is, we can take care of people without relying on anybody, um, even these career positions, right? But, but to answer the question in a, in a like, this is the world where we are today, um, one of the biggest things that I've been advocating for is um, the need that police do not need to go to mental health calls um, for a various you know, amount of reasons. One of being which is that they are unstable. And I'm not saying that on my own personal opinion, that's like we have data and, and facts to prove that cops abuse their partners they're alcoholics. They, they like, you know, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be a cop apologist, but they also have trauma dealing with death and all this type of stuff that they're not checking. Right. So now we're expecting these people with this high stress job to go check on somebody um, that's in a mental health crisis. Right. Makes no sense. Um, so we need people that actually go to school for this far longer than, um, you know, in Austin, I think a, a cadet class is six to 12 weeks. Right. I know. How about we actually send people that go to school for this for years, right? Um, like, like they do, and I believe, it, I think it's Denver or Eugene or, um, um, no, it's in Eugene, Oregon, the COOTS program, where they just have this very simple idea, let's not send cops. Let's send social workers and people that know how to deal with these people. Um, and to this day, unless something happened in the last 48 hours, nobody has been killed when COOTS shows up to deal with somebody that's going through a mental health crisis, right? Or when you look at Seattle, they have this DESC program to where um, people that experience a homelessness, like they can go here and get resources they need. Or when people see somebody that is experiencing homelessness going through something, they refer them or they take them to DESC and like they deal with it that way, right? Um, Erica Ford, uh, the most amazing black woman I know in New York, um, um, and I believe Brooklyn has, um, I can't think of the name right now, but she has her street um, intervention team to where she has literally gone in and reduced gun violence by like 100, 200% because they have people that have been impacted by um, gun violence and gang violence to go out and, and do the work needed to keep the tensions down, right? So like these people exist and we have to keep that in mind that, you know, we can't keep looking to um, this thing, <laughs> right? To, to give us the answer. The answer has always lied within. Um, and if I can, you know, be quite honest, you know, I've been joking a lot lately, but it, it, it needs to be said if we only listen to like black um, and indigenous women, um, you know, quite honestly, queer women, right? When you read Bell Hooks, Black Feminism, and she talks about centering folks, like if you go back and listen to these communities for years, they've always had the answers. We just never listened to them, right? We always push them to the side and push them to the margins. So like these answers already exist. We just have to like look within and look to ourselves and actually do the work. Because when we don't do the work, the system says, um, okay, well, now you need us, right? And it, it just goes back to um, just really realizing the people power that we have. I'm sorry, that was long. I won't say nothing else for like 10 minutes. It's okay. Thank you so much. I mean, you're saying all good things. Um, we are getting down to about our last 15 minutes. So if you guys want to answer, but keep it a little concise, that would be great. And I don't see any more questions. Um, I'm not sure if we'll have any more, maybe just one wrap it up, but if you guys just want to touch on that question still about um, an alternative to a police officer, what their duties would look like, or who would take over those duties. I agree with what Chaz was saying. I mean, it looks like bringing in professionals for that specific um, call or that specific issue that's happening. I mean, cops are not everything. They cannot possibly handle everything. And um, sadly, because of the lack of training that they have, um, everything wants to get settled with like excessive force. And so um, when we bring in people who understand what it's like to have some type of trauma, whether it's childhood, because even childhood trauma affects you as an adult. And it doesn't even, maybe that trauma doesn't even come out until you're an adult and something dramatic happens to you. And so um, bringing in these mental health people um, in, these mental health providers in to, um, that, that's exactly what, what, you know, is needed. Bringing in people that specialize in these areas. If they're dealing with somebody undocumented, bring in the people that are, I mean, don't arrest somebody because they're not, they don't have legal documentation. Like what, what? Like, 
you know, it's just, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I agree um, with with both of y'all in that um, one listening to the most marginalized um, queer and trans um, black people will always get us closer because who better than them to understand what the exact opposite of oppression looks like. Um, once you've experienced all these layers of oppression, you you know exactly what not to do so that someone can thrive and move beyond survival mode um, because you've you've seen the opposite of that. So I want to build with that person um, be, uh, because their vision is much greater. Um, that cha it challenges so much more uh, what the existing system is. And um, in terms of who's going to fill these jobs, I, I don't know how much I believe in like professionalized jobs, but we're not here to talk about that because that becomes confusing. Um, but I just want to add that uh, we don't have those jobs yet, but what would it look like to have things in the medical field, um, spaces in the medical field that go beyond just the harm has already happened to you and then you go in seeking for help? What does it look like to get at these issues before them. Um, a lot of why we seek uh, urgent, like why we call 911 is, might be because of domestic violence, might be because of um, just parental abuse or negligence. Um, these things need to be addressed. I'm not saying get rid of the police and let everyone suffer. I'm saying what y'all are all saying, which is how, how do we, um, how do we get people ready to intervene in those situations before they get um, violent, before they get deadly. And uh, the reality is that police show up to instances after the crime has already been committed. So they're not really stopping much crime. Um, additionally, like, or for example, people say, well, we need cops in our schools. Um, but I don't know how many school shootings cops have stopped in the last few years. Um, we've seen so many mass shootings that have not been prevented. What does it look like to reach people um, before they get to that level of desperation and, and harm other people? And a lot of it looks like feeding people. Okay, we don't need no fancy uh, job titles or professional titles. That's what I meant by that. To, to do that, we just need to make sure people is fed, people is housed, people is clothed, people feel productive with their lives, people have access to quality healthcare that is not connected to whether they have or don't have a job. What people need is lives that can sustain themselves and their loved ones. Um, and when people have their basic material needs met, you're not going to see obviously uh, as much of that desperate act to lash out against the system that's harmed them. So I don't know that that means we need like professional jobs. I think that means we need to do basic uh, outreach to the most marginalized people in, the, in society, di um, differently abled folks, um, queer and trans folks, incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people because again, recidivism rates are really high and that's because jail doesn't work. Okay, cops don't work. Okay, we, we, we need these folks to have their needs met. And that looks like taking all the funding for cops and law enforcement and the CIA and FBI and all, FBI and all those programs and giving them to um, the material needs of the millions of Americans who need them. Yes, if y'all saw me raising my hands on that one part, it's because um, I'm a I'm a, st a nursing student, and so like for me, preventative is my whole like life concept word. It's let's what well, what can we do before we get to that point, right? Because that's all that this is. That's pretty much all this conversation is stemming from. It's how can we stop this before it gets to that point? Why are we not doing rehabilitation like we should in the prison so that you don't come back instead of hoping that you do? And placing you right back where you were, where you, where you, how you got here in the first place, you know, that sort of thing, that sort of ideal is, I think, just the cycle, you know, getting caught in the system. It's all the same thing. Um, 
so they told me that we have a couple, we can keep going if we want to flow. And so I have a couple more questions and we're getting some more questions from uh, people that are out there. Um, I'm going to wrap up with the question that they just said, but I want to touch on, um, what was I about to say? I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Sorry, you guys. So we're going to go with the question. It says, what are some good icebreaker points to start having with friends and family when it comes to talking about defunding law enforcement? And this is a great question because of people, especially I feel like people that are not black or people that are not very, um, into, I guess you could say the movement or, you know, what's going on. They might have a question of like, how do you, or how do I, if I do understand the movement, how do you start that without, you know, getting the, you know, argumentative sort of thing. You just kind of want to talk about it sort of, you know, if anyone wants to start. So we're talking about icebreaker points and having with family, especially, I think is a good point as family. Oh, Deborah, gotcha. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't go up to my mom and be like, hey, mom, <laughs> how do you feel about not having any uh, type of protection for people like us who are obvious, who are often the victims of violence? Um, but I would say uh, something like, what do you need in your life um, for, for, your, for you to thrive? Um, a lot of times we talk about what we don't want um, we don't want cops, we don't want um, violence, we don't want, you know, murder, um, but we don't talk about what do we want then? So what are, what kind of world are we looking to live in? And when folks start to say, you know, I just want a place where, you know, um, I can be productive and my family can thrive, uh, then you say, do you want that for just yourself? Or how do you feel about that for the people that we ignore every day on the streets of Austin? Um, and then the conversation gets a little hairier because everybody can agree that we want food, clothes, housing, healthcare, education, stuff like that. Um, but then people only want it for themselves. And so if you begin to you know, encourage, how, what does it look like to get that for everyone? Um, and then actually the discussion around cops and defunding them comes way later when people realize that, well, if everyone is to live the life that I'm asking to live for myself and my family, then, then they, there's no way to have that with cops. There's no way that the two can go harmoniously. And again, I don't care how well-trained the cops are, um, all, all of what they're looking for will be connected to not having capitalism as our main system of exchange and survival. I mean, yeah, I, I agree with her. Um, what would be a good icebreaker? I mean, I just go straight at it because I talk a lot about, you know, the whole defunding police for me is I'm still getting my feet wet on that. I'm hardcore into abolishing ICE. And so um, when I bring up the subject of abolishing ICE, um, a lot of people get freaked out also because then they think, oh my God, they want open borders. They want just anybody coming in here. And so, I mean, that's, me when I have my conversations I don't I just go straight at the conversation like hey because I will tell me well what do you care like even though I'm Mexican I'm first generation Mexican-American so I was born here and I was born in Los Angeles I was born here in the states and so we're like well what do you care you're a U.S. citizen what do you care if somebody gets deported um I care because my mom once crossed the border my mom one once was undocumented you know, she got her papers through amnesty and because she had a daughter who was born in the U.S., which happened to be me. And so um, I have the way I start my conversations, is especially because I look white. So, I mean, that's a whole other conversation, but um, people are always confused as to what I am <laughs> because I look white, but yet I'm Spanish and I'm Mexican. And so these are I start with those conversations, you know, um, 
Also touching on what Deborah was saying, I have a foundation called La Monarca Foundation where we feed families. We feed undocumented families. Well, now we're feeding everybody, um, anybody that needs food. But we, I believe if people, like she said, if people have their basic needs, then chaos won't happen. You know, chaos happens when people freak out because they don't have their basic necessities. A lot of the times the families that I specifically help through my foundation are people that just want to feel supported. Like they just want to know that somebody's there to support them in whatever it is that they need. And so um, that's really important as a community. And I think in, when we build community, we have to make sure that we feel supported this is why it's important for us to create a village, a tribe, you know, and this is why I go back talking about indigenous also just like Chaz, because that's what they were, a tribe. They were just a community. And so um, I think going back and, and building community is important, but definitely just, you know, as icebreaker wise, it's just, you know, what would, what if it was us, you know, at the point where we're going politically, we could end up refugees and end up fleeing to Canada or even Mexico. I mean, you know, so if it was us or our children, we would want the same compassion as some of us do within the community. You know, I, um, I, I think the, the board hit the fact that, um, or the point that I was gonna make. So something that I've been doing recently is, um, you know, and as an organization, we just ask people to imagine a world without police. And of course, the first thing they go to, because, you know, we operate out of fear is, you know, murder and mayhem and blah, blah, blah. And then I say, okay, you know what? Cool. Uh, so now imagine a world where those people or people reacting like that didn't exist. What does that world look like? Right. And then they start saying, well, you know, we would have um, jobs for everybody. We would have better schools for everybody and blah, 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 blah. So and then when I get them to understand that, and like, that's the world that we're trying to get to. And in order to get to that world, we need to take this massive amount of money that's in police systems across the country. So we can build these things that would prevent people um, from really, in my personal opinion, operating um, in survival mode um, and, and in trauma, right? I think a really good book for a lot of people to read is Until We Reckon um, by Daniel Serrett. It just talks about you know, how these systems just keep creating more and more trauma, how they keep creating people that are going to keep giving into um, harm, right? Um, so the, the more we can not have these systems that do that, then we can get to this world where people are not afraid and feel this incessant need to have law enforcement. Um, because it's also like a huge conversation that needs to be had around like, you know, what like, what is a law, right? Like, th there's a conversation about the morality of our laws in this country. Um, so, you know, it's just like, I, I think if we, if we can get people to see the humanity and the vision of what we're trying to do when we say defund the police and the humanity in um, really doing away with these systems, right? It's so liberating when you think about um, this world where people can just live and exist and be, and we have our own social constructs and we take care of one another and nobody with guns is coming blazing, just shooting us because we, we have loud music or we're walking home with Skittles and, and tea, you know, right? It's, it's like, um, I, I think the more we can start controlling the narrative, right? Which is something that's really big in, in you know, black and indigenous communities. Um, I think we can start getting people to lean in a little bit more because it, the board is right. People operate out of fear because we've been trained and socialized to think that every cop is Carl Winslow from Family Matters. I don't even know if y'all are old enough to remember that, but um, I've never met a Carl Winslow. I'm, I'm, maybe one right but like that's one out of the the tens of thousands that that run the streets and that run rampant in black and brown and poor communities right so um until we understand that all we've been taught about um these people like the uncle phil's and even um you know um uncle phil right who was a judge <laughs> uh, and you, you think like oh man these are these people are good they do good work and then you and then you start reading the news when you get like a teenager and realize like the world is a terrible place <laughs> Um, it, it's, it's like, you, you, as soon as you take the veil off, you can start imagining that world where we don't really need these things because, I mean, we don't. And the more we have them, the more black and brown people and people that are poor will die. Yeah, 
Can I just add on a little bit to that too? We need to decolonize ourselves because we're brainwashed to think that police is it, that ICE is it, that we need them. We need Homeland Security. We need all of this. And in reality, we don't. And so we're so brainwashed. Like, I don't know if you guys have seen the commercials that um, Trump is putting out that what defunding the police looks like. <laughs> And it's like cities burning down. And so we also, like you said, we have to change that narrative because someone asked me, well, what do you want to see the purge? And it's like, uh, what? Like, so people have this, you know, we need to decolonize people, change the narrative and just get them out of that whole thinking that this is it without police, you know, we're going to have chaos and murder and, and rape and all these horrible things are gonna happen, but they don't think, wait a minute, let's build community. Let's protect each other. Like when, when the pandemic first started, I literally organized my whole block on my street to where everybody was getting about produce. Um, if they saw anything weird, they we would text each other and let each other know. Um, and it was like something so simple to do. And I was in contact with all of my neighbors and all my neighbors loved it. They felt so secure because you never know what could happen, you know, especially when they were shutting down the city of Dallas. And so um, I think that's important. We need to get to know our neighbors. We need to really build a community with each other. And like you said, to change that narrative, um, that way we could see what a world without police and law enforcement actually looks like. It's, it's a really terrible M. Night Shyamalan movie called The Village. Um, that That is kind of like the whole thing, right? Like we we think that this is it and everybody is telling us not to leave the village. And then you get out there, you're like, oh man, what is this? It's not that bad, right? Um, I, that's America 2020. Well, that's America forever, really. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, another icebreaker question uh, could be like, why are you defending the system? that oppresses you or that might oppress your neighbor. Um, why are we, what, what gain do we get from caping so hard for these politicians and these police? You know, um, a lot of people are scared of the protesting, protesting and protesters of the last couple of months. But I encourage folks who can and are willing to get out there and listen to what these protesters' experiences have been. Because for me, the violence I'm scared of is for what I saw from the police, tear gassing, um, shooting non-lethal or less lethal weapons. Um, that is violence. I was scared of that for people, you know, in theory, um, using their First Amendment rights. And suddenly cops are just wreaking havoc on protesters. Um, and I'm not saying that to scare you because there's strength in numbers and the cops retreat when we are out strong. So I do encourage folks to continue protesting because the fight has not stopped. Um, in the name of Mike Ramos, in the name of Breonna Taylor, in the name of George Floyd, in the name of everyone who has been slain by state sanctioned murder, we need to be out here filling in, filling out our streets. Um, we paid for these streets, okay? And we will have to continue to defend our streets because they're not doing it. The violence I'm scared of is the one that they're perpetuating on communities. Um, and that racist vigilantes are perpetuating on communities. And then the way that police are supported by politicians, for example, District Attorney Margaret Moore um, is refusing to drop the charges against these protesters who've been out there defending black lives. We need people who are gonna listen to our demands um, and support, support people who are, utilizing their First Amendment rights. Um, it's because of her uh, cowardice that the Drop the Charges Coalition had to form. And that's another thing I want folks to look up if they have the chance, www.dropthecharges2020.org. 
Um, there's a coalition of organizations who are trying to make sure protesters with misdemeanors and felonies are not being penalized for using their First Amendment right, for speaking out on behalf of Black lives. So look into that if you have a chance. But yeah, ultimately, the violence I'm scared of is the police violence. And I have no, I gain nothing from defending a system that oppresses me and all my ancestors before me. That's a good point is that, I mean, I love that whole, um, you know, uh, what was your, um, sorry, say that one more time what your uh, website was. Absolutely. The website was because I'm writing it down. <laughs> www.dropthecharges2020.org. And if you have an organization that would like to join the coalition, join it because there are thousands, there are hundreds of protesters that have all sorts of trumped up charges brought against them. And what happens when you have a charge? Well, you lose employment opportunity, housing can discriminate against you, um, your mental health suffers. So Margaret Moore needs to step up and or her successor, Jose Garza, needs to step up and commit to dropping the charges against every single protester. We don't see a divide between good and bad protester in the same way I don't see a divide between good and bad immigrant. Drop all the charges and that's what this code Wow, that's that's great. That's deep. Um, well, one thing I wanted to t touch on is that, like, another icebreaker. Personally, I was just thinking about is um, honestly, you know, you don't want to come off too. I know some people are worried to come off too aggressive um, in conversations, which I totally understand. I'm with um, Denise, though. I'm a you know, I'm gonna talk about it. I don't care type of person, um, but I do understand you know that kind of mindset. Um, I would say to ask them, what do you think they do? Like, tell me, what do you think the police do? I mean, you know, because who really knows? Unless you have a family member, which I do have family members that are policemen. But, you know, it's like, what do you think they do? And as um, I actually just got out of um, being in, in study for EMT. And whenever we show up to a call, you know, most of the time it's us and the police. And when I tell you at least, at least 80% of calls are mental health. Any something, like you said, social... Um, badgering or you know something like that it's nothing usually like you know that dramatic I would say quote unquote it's still dramatic because it's I mean it's affecting someone right to call police um so I don't want to put take an emphasis off of someone being hurt but it's like you said what kind of need do they need do they need to be thrown in the back of a cop car 90% of the time no you know it's usually something that is mental health they need to be talked about they need to have some support in the community so that's just one thing that I wanted you know that's one thing that you can start with is what do you think they do and, you know, throw some numbers out there. People listen to numbers. You can't deny facts. You know, you can say all your, your opinions and all you want. Some people won't listen. But if you put a fact out there and say, hey, well, this is happening. These are the numbers. They're not lying. These are the numbers of murders or, you know, whatever it may be. I mean, numbers always talk more than words for me. That's always what I've thought. And, you know, same thing with police brutality. I mean, we see these things, but, you know, the numbers are what is, you know, what is getting everyone riled up to do these rallies and stuff. So, like I said, numbers speak. Um, so this is a, a kind of concluding question. I mean, we probably might get some more, um, but it says, how may we further bring our POCs, uh, sorry, people of color and marginalized communities together in solidarity? So this is a big question um, that I think you guys can talk on. So just how can we come together and, you know, I think support each other, I guess. In I can start that. I'm really big on big uh, black brown communities coming together because um, we don't have that conversation of how similar we are on how we um, have, the, we suffer from the same system. So the same system is oppressing black and brown communities. And I think bringing that, that narrative together and helping our, especially our brown community, our elders <laughs> um, understand that we're all together, you know, and um, because unfortunately, in our, and I'm going to speak on behalf of Mexicans because I'm Mexican, so I could only speak on behalf of my Mexican culture, is that um, there is a lot of um, 
bias and racism and prejudice against the black community, especially from our elders. And so I think changing that narrative and talking to the younger people, because we could never change our elders' minds, right? Like they're set in their ways and they think how they think. But I think talking to the younger, the younger um, generation um, about our similarities and how to bring each other together, like me particularly, food is a big thing in our cultures, right? And so we could always have a good conversation over a great plate of food or even cook together. And so um, I think bringing those two similarities together is so important. And that's how we could bring, you know, those two communities together. You, you know, I, I think it goes back to your to your earlier point, um, Denise, about um, decolonizing, right? Because, you know, it's anti-blackness in the brown community. It's anti-blackness in the black community. Um, it's 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 homophobia in the black community. It's homophobia. It's it's misogyny. It's all these things that, um, again, we've picked up from, you know, the this system. Um, so I think as we are talking about building community within these two, um, I think we have to first have those conversations. Um, I think we have to um, not so much call each other out, but call, well, call out and call in or, you know, whatever, both of those um, to make sure we're not bringing harm into that, right? Like something um, I've been telling um, at least white people, um, you know, you can't be white and say Black Lives Matter and still hold on to white privilege, right? You, 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 have, to pick, you have to pick one of these things. You can't, because you can't bring this over into this new world we're trying to Bring because it's a cancer and it'll spread at some point. So, um, and I, I think really, I'm going back to what Deborah said, like we have to realize that there's really no gain or benefit from the system at all, right? And like we, we have to, um, I think we lose people when we paint the picture that we have to be willing to struggle together, right? Um, like that's why we can't keep letting the, the immigration issue be painted as a, a, a Latinx issue, right? Because we know that there are, are there are African immigrants. There are people in the African diaspora that are deported more. Um, but the way the media tells it, right, just like oh, black people don't worry about this. Same thing. Like we can't let the the narrative be, you know, police brutality is is a black people issue. No, that's literally an everybody issue. Like everybody dies at the hand of police, and it affects black and brown people more because of numbers, right? Um, so I think we have to be willing to realize that. The system wants us to be against one another. The system socializes us to think that there's um, not this abundance of wealth and resources. And they also socialize us to think that wealth just means like capital dollars, right? Like, so we have to get back to knowing um, who we are, where we come from, and knowing that for us, for black and indigenous folks, our greatest resources has always, has always, always, and forever been each other, right? Like our culture, um, it has literally um, kept us alive for this for this long, right? Right? Like so. Um, I mean that you know that's my very. I know we're running out of time. Answer uh, very quick. You know. Um, the only thing I was going to add is what y'all said is great. Uh, Anti-blackness is absolutely global. We have internalized it and. If it took, you know, 400, 500 years to get to this point, then it's going to take, ooh, let me not say that, curses, curses. It's going to take a long, long time to undo that too. Um, but, you know, one of the things we have to ask ourselves and our organizations is what are you, what are we doing um, to challenge Spanish speaking media? What are we doing, um, like Univision and Telemundo, when they um, paint protests for Black Lives Matter as, you know, negative things, what are we doing to challenge that narrative? What is Jolt doing to use their relationships um, with both politicians and media to challenge um, negative Spanish media, uh, you know, uh, narratives? Um, what are other organizations doing to challenge gentrification and the eviction of black and brown folks, both during this pandemic, after this pandemic and before this pandemic. Um, these are the needs of our people. Um, the needs of our people are not body cameras. They are not more um, soup kitchens 
necessarily we don't want charity we want solidarity and that looks like um building leadership and just regular regular community members um you know being side by side with each other and meeting each other's needs and filling in where the gaps are we, we can never depend on the system to do that it hasn't for hundreds of years and it won't start to today so um i would just encourage all all our organizations to um first have the conversations in their own boards um like if 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 you're challenging anti-blackness then your your board and your staff um, and your entire NGO makeup should not be like no black people. Um, if you're challenging anti blackness, then you should be questioning why um, you should be challenging all media, not just Spanish speaking media, but any of the connections and relationships you have with politicians, with media, with uh, other community organizations. There's no space for white supremacy um, in, in solidarity. When we're talking about solidarity, there's no space for white supremacy. When we're talking about charity, there's tons of space for white supremacy. Charity has is full of white supremacy. That's a different discussion for us to get into. Maybe next time we can talk about the differences of solidarity and charity, but I just encourage all of us to show up in solidarity with each other. And um, yeah. And really quickly, I wanted to add to what Chaz said about getting to know yourself. A lot of our Mexican community does not know that our second president was black. A lot of our, our black brothers and sisters fought with us in the Mexican Revolution. And Mexico was one of the first countries to abolish slavery. But yet we have all this anti-blackness in our community. And so I think first it takes healing. And healing part of it is having these conversations within our own, like, like I have these conversations within my community, because I'm trying to get my community to understand that, you know, there, there's no room for anti-Blackness, especially when the Black community was helping us fight, you know, in the Mexican Revolution was something really it went on for a long time and so um getting that's why we need to decolonize ourselves to remember who we are and we need to ground ourselves and that's extremely important get to know where we come from sorry one one more thing really quickly um since you know we're in austin uh i just want to encourage any organization or person leader who's watching this to take the lead of groups like Mike Ramos Brigade in terms of demanding the immediate firing of office um, Chief Manley, um, a hack job who has uh, hampered any type of relationship this community could have possibly had with police, um, and also murderers, officers, Taylor, uh, Christopher Taylor and Mitchell Piper. Um, they're the murderers who killed Mike Ramos and they need to immediately be absolutely fired. Um, and that is a part of what, just a tiny part of what people's justice could look like. So just throwing that out there for those who might be gatekeepers in, in this scenario, that's what solidarity looks like. Thank you, thank you, thank you, you guys. I cannot say this enough. So, oh gosh, y'all have my wheels spinning right now. <laughs> um, but I think that's a good place to end. If you guys want to say anything else to try to wrap up, uh, Denise or Chaz, anything, any kind of shameless plugs you want to put out there? Anything? Uh, my foundation, <laughs> it's um, lamonarcafoundation.org. Um, we help undocumented communities. I've been doing this work now for a long time. And a year ago, I decided to start um, a quote unquote nonprofit. Um, and, um, but it doesn't have that white supremacy culture in it. <laughs> We're very grassroots. Um, and so yes, check us out. We have our Facebook page. It's L-A-M-O-N-A-R-C-A, -A -A, La Monarca Foundation. Yeah, I just want to add to what Deborah said. Um, in addition to Chief Manley, you know, we, we think um, Chief Manley needs to go assistant, no, not assistant, 
Um, Chief of Staff Troy Gay needs to go. City Manager of Public Safety needs to go. And um, after meeting with Ms. Ramos today, um, not only those two officers, we think every um, every officer that was in that video, um, we, you know, when we're talking about, um, um, you know, the room for white supremacy, like they plan, to me, when I watched that video, it seems like premeditated murder, right? Um, but, you know, that, I'm not a lawyer. That's just my random black guy advice. Um, so we think all those officers need to be held accountable. Um, and, you know, I also think, I think um, Kim Cassidy needs to be held accountable too, right? He said some um, really atrocious things about Garrett Foster. Um, so, you know, again, I think um, what that accountability looks like, I'm, I'm still struggling with because I'm trying to get into this world of abolition where we don't have prisms and shit like that. So, I, you know, I, you know, I'm dealing with that tension, but um, they, they definitely need to be held accountable for um, for the things they said. And but those officers, for sure, um, as I sit there and watch them plan um, the ultimate demise of Mike Ramos, I think every officer in that scenario um, should be fired. And last but not least, I I cannot say again that um, Brian Manley, right? Not Chief Manley. Brian Manley, the person, may be a good guy. But Chief Manley, the person that bears that uniform, um, is is dangerous. Um, he he cultivates a culture of of complacency. He co he cultivates a culture of of lacking concern and empathy for for people that live on the east side of thirty five, predominantly black and brown and poor people. Um, and you know, um, I, I hope you know we have different tactics and, and methodologies and ideologies, but I hope. Um, groups like the Mike Ramos Brigade and other groups like that just keep in the streets until he is gone because um, he is he is a cancer to this city. And like the board said, there's no possible way for anybody in this community that truly stands for Black Lives Matter or, or, or anything um, progressive and, and liberal or liberating. Um, there's no room to work with him, right? So, you know, he he has to go before we can even start talking about policy work before we can start talking about, you know, you know, anything um, when it comes to APD. So, um, yeah, you know, we walked away from that table the day Mike Ramos died and we don't plan to doing any work because we do think um, keeping an eye on APD is important. But at this point, um, while he's there, that that's a very long, long way um, down the road. So I hope people join us in that because he is not here for, um, he he's not he's not here for for regular people, like at all. So, I'm, I know that was a lot. I'm sorry. Look, this is a time you know. This is a platform for you guys to you know reach out to people. This is what I think um, you know us at Jolt want is just to you know to spread the word and get everyone interested and knowledgeable. I think I think having you know a set of tools with us is our biggest. Um, power, you know, each other and communicating. So anything you guys want to say for sure, drop that in there. Well, I definitely, well, want, to, oh, I definitely want to thank you because this is how we build power, having these conversations between black and brown people. And um, this is how we build power. And this is what they don't want. And this is why, you know, adding on, this is why they want to pin us against each other. When in reality, we're in numbers were bigger. And I'm excited because we needed more of the black community to come to the border with us. There's a lot of work out there and it's hard. Like when we're fighting that whole system, just us, when we see a lot of people suffering at the border, there's a lot of black brothers and sisters right now stuck in Mexico and we need help. And so thank you for even inviting us to this. I'm honored. Thank you. No problem. Yes, you're absolutely right. I think that, I mean, as a Jolt member, I personally, that, that's my biggest thing that I told you all the time is why I love this organization is because, you know, it's not just, oh, it's Latinx, they embrace me. I just want to help, you know, I just wanted to know what to do and what to help and Joel embraced me and I've been a member and being an activist and, you know, they understand that, you know, Black Lives Matter is happening. And so it's like, oh, boom, you know, add that with this and add this with this, like it's all coming together. It's about all of us together, helping each other, you know, get to a certain point and liberate ourselves, so. Yeah, no problem. I just want to thank everyone on Facebook for joining us. Thank you for being here. Um, thank you to our wonderful, lovely 
uh, speakers today. You guys have been wonderful. I love having this conversation with you guys. Um, if you want to, I'm sure you can probably find them on Facebook. I think they're linked to this um, Facebook ad, so you can go and follow all their pages, look up some more information about them. They are wonderful people if you guys dive into them. I did because I had to, because I do bios, but <laughs> um, guys, wonderful people. Um, we do have a form for uh, down below in the comments that's going to be just something you can fill out for Jolt, and they'll keep you in, um, they'll keep you interested in uh, giving out emails about, you know, what's going on with this topic. And also just everything Jolt. So thank you guys for joining us. Uh, also, just shameless plug for Jolt. Um, join us for our next Jolt talk with Congress Congressman Dodgett. Um, they'll be asking him about um, poli uh, being politically engaged. And uh, let's see, oh, why he drove, uh, what's his drive for the Texas Supreme Court and why he did run for Congressman and uh, how can young people be civically engaged, which will be Wednesday, August the 5th at 6 p.m. So thank you guys for joining us. Like I said, go follow Jolt, go follow all these people. Thank you, Deborah, Chaz, Denise, love you guys. Definitely gonna be hitting you guys up for you know more Q and A's maybe and learning how we can all connect more. So thank you. Thank you for moderating, Clark, appreciate you. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Clap sign, thank you guys. I don't know if they're gonna continue, there we go. Okay, we're off. <laughs>